Would you stand with me as you turn there? There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze their young, they shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand over the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. This is the word of God. You may be seated. morning. Well, it's so good to be here with you all this morning. Uh, For those of you who I've not met yet, which I think is a number of you, my name is Jared, and um, like Skylar said, my wife Shelly and I, we we call OGC home, and we love this church very deeply. And um, we ourselves as a family have been watching online for months now, and so it's wonderful to be here in person with you all this morning. And I'm trying to get myself, get everything up here to where it'll all fit this morning. Well, I, uh, I am, I'll date myself. I am a child of the 80s, born in the early 1980s. And so uh, what I'm about to talk about, uh, it's probably going to bring about some nostalgia for those of you from my generation for what I think may be the greatest playground invention of all time. Long ago, relegated to the dust heap of playground equipment. And I'm talking about the rusted, round, platform, spinning platform known as the merry-go-round or the twirl-about. And some of you may remember this piece of playground equipment. Ten children begin, begin running outside of the spinning fortress, grabbing handles, spinning it faster and faster and faster, one by one, hopping on as this human centrifuge continues to spin faster and faster, usually leaving one final unfortunate soul left hanging on, moving faster than their little feet are able to carry them, attempting to make the Olympian athletic feat of jumping on the centrifuge more often than not resulting in the child going around in the least merriest of ways, hanging on to the bar for dear life and earning a face full of gravel and a tetanus booster for his efforts, all while the children that made it onto the merry-go-round get a great laugh at his expense. I really can think of no better picture of what it often feels like to be a Christian in this world that we live in today, and especially in the cultural moment we are in now, known as a political election. News media and social media are well compensated by providing for us only the viral, and so the stories that are reported are pushed to the most extreme on both sides of the political aisle in an effort for clicks, shares, and likes. There's no more space for the boring middle ground of things like understanding and conversation, context, and nuance. The information that we're bombarded with constantly comes custom designed to attract attention to our ever-scanning eyes for eight seconds at a time with the sole purpose of getting us to take that millisecond that it takes to click or to push our finger on a screen and send it on to all of our friends, and a news feed that's custom curated by algorithms working from the data collected from our clicks and likes to keep us drawn in for more. Flipping our finger down on our screen, flipping down on the screen like a slot machine, excited for what news might be coming next. And in this world of pandemic and division 
and an ever-refreshing 24-7 news cycle that keeps it coming. Answers just don't seem to come easy anymore. And often when they do come, we're confused as to whether or not to trust them. And so what we're left with a lot of times is fear and doubt and confusion. Oftentimes we're stuck feeling like little Johnny trying to find a handle to grab onto in this spinning world, not knowing where the right place to jump on is at and often hanging on for dear life as it feels like we're taking a metaphorical slide in the gravel. If you come here this morning feeling discombobulated, feeling like your stressors outnumber your capacity, searching for these answers that never seem to come easy, you're not alone. And if you throw your hands up and you wonder, how are we as Christians supposed to respond in this cultural moment, which, let's be honest, often now feels more like a cultural millisecond before we need to wrap our heads around a whole lot of new issues. Well, you're not alone in that either. We need a reset. In our passage this morning, the prophet Isaiah offers exactly that, a reset in a world wrought with fear and uncertainty. When we get to our passage today, we find the kingdom of Israel, God's people, it's long, by the time Isaiah is writing here, it's long been split into two, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And at this time when Isaiah is writing, the king of the southern kingdom, the king of Judah, of the line of David, King Ahaz, well, King Ahaz no longer really believes in God. And it's evident by when he's being attacked by his own brothers from the northern kingdom of Israel. They've, they've made an alliance with the pagan nation of Syria to attack the southern kingdom. King Ahaz chooses not to listen to Isaiah, who tells him the Lord will protect his people, and instead chooses rather to make another pagan alliance with another pagan nation, the kingdom of Assyria, and in doing so, in many ways, he starts what is to be the beginning of the end for his brothers in the northern kingdom. They're going to be destroyed by Assyria not long after Ahaz's reign. So when Isaiah is writing in our passage this morning, things are not okay in his country. And Isaiah doesn't turn a blind eye to the issues of what's going on in this time. No, he spends the first several chapters of this book railing on both King Ahaz and the northern kingdom of Israel for their apostasy and their idolatry. And then Isaiah offers a reset. And that's where we are this morning in chapter 11. And Isaiah's reset, I think, can serve as a reset for us today. Because the Lord's message through Isaiah to the people of God in his day and his message to us as the people of God in this day is this. You have a king that surpasses the kings of this world. You belong to a kingdom that surpasses the kingdoms of this world. And therefore, you always have hope in fearful times. You have a king that surpasses the kings of this world. You belong to a kingdom that surpasses the kingdoms of this world. And therefore, you always have hope in fearful times. First, you have an all-surpassing king. Look with me at verse 1 in Isaiah 11. He writes, There shall come forth the shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Isaiah in verse 1 refers to Jesse. Jesse, of course, being the father of King David. David was of Jesse's root. And God had made a promise to David when he was the king that someone from his line would reign over the throne of his people forever. But by the time 
we get to King Ahaz when Isaiah is writing, the reality is that David's line has lost much, much of its power. Long gone are the glory days of military victory under David, the glory days of wealth and prosperity under Solomon. What was a dream of a kingdom that was for God and was protected by God was quickly becoming a smoldering past hope that was on the verge of despair. Jesse's line at this point was a mere stump. And we know here in verse 1, just by the mention of Jesse, just by Isaiah using that name, he's talking about a king. He's referring to a king, a king over the people of God. And who is this king that Isaiah speaks of? Well, look at how he describes him. He's kind of the anti-Ahaz in a lot of ways. He's filled with the spirit of the Lord. He has wisdom, counsel, and strength. He fears the Lord. He doesn't wander off into rumor or make quick judgments based on what his eyes see. He defends the poor and the needy. He doesn't take advantage of them for political gain like Ahaz had done. He defeats his enemies by the word of his mouth, so he doesn't need pagan alliances. He's faithful to the Lord. He can be trusted. This is a good king of the likes that Judah has not seen. And I have to point out of the likes that we desire today. And who is this king that Isaiah speaks of? Well, the reality is there would be good kings that would come after Ahaz. Hezekiah and Josiah were two good kings that would come after Ahaz, but ultimately they would fail. Their failures are recorded in scripture. Ultimately they would die. Their deaths are recorded in scripture. And David's line would seem to continue to smolder. And after the northern kingdom falls, the southern kingdom eventually would fall to Babylon. They would be sent into exile. And a vast majority of the rest of the history afterwards would be one of a conquered people with no king of David to sit on the throne. That is, until a child was born, born in David's city, of David's line, a child who came up under the reign of pagan kings. See, ultimately, Jesus Christ, he is the shoot from the weak, conquered stump of Jesse. He is the branch from his roots. The gospel writers clearly show us that Jesus is the one who was anointed with the spirit, who spoke no wrong, who clearly loved and cared for the lowly in the land, And by his death on the cross, his death that takes on the fullness of the wrath of God for the sin, the junk, for the failures of this world, for the sin that reigns in our hearts, that death, by that death and by his resurrection, which proclaimed that neither Satan nor sin nor death itself had any power over him, Christ purchased for himself a kingdom of those who are citizens, not by birth, not by purchase, not by property rights, but citizens only by being united to him through faith in him so that as he is, so we are. That's the king that Isaiah is speaking of. That's the anti-Ahaz. And that's the king that we today long for. We have a king and that king is reigning today. He is far greater far more powerful, far more perfect than any king of Judah up to that point. And he's more powerful today than any presidential candidate or congressman or congresswoman or any judge that could be appointed in any amount of time. These are all passing. If you are in Christ, you worship a greater king. And in the midst of the craziness of these times and the the polarization that pushes us to, to one end or the other, we have to remember that we serve this greater king. And I, I do think that's especially pertinent to talk about, right, when we're in the middle of this election season. Because when I watch the news, when I hear people talk about the futures or these issues that are going on right now, what I hear oftentimes is people who are in many cases overwhelmed with fear. 
And I don't doubt that this is the state that many of us are in as we prepare uh, to go to the polls and cast our votes or mail in our ballots or however you're choosing to do that. Now, before I say what I'm about to say, I want to clarify one thing right off the bat. There are some who would say, yes, we have a king that surpasses the rulers of this world. And what that means is that we don't need to involve ourselves in the rulers of this world, right? We don't, we don't need to engage in these issues. We, we don't need to participate and do things like vote or participate in the politics. That's of the world. And there's this strong wall that exists between our faith and the world, right? Our faith stays in here. The world stays out there. That's not what I'm saying this morning. I fully believe that our faith not only can but must touch every part of our life. It is not a compartment. It is the entirety through which we view every compartment. And because of that, we don't withdraw from the world. We don't withdraw from these issues. We engage. We, we seek the scriptures for how we are supposed to view these things. And we act on what we believe. And so for that reason, we do participate. We do engage. We do things like vote, right? And I, I've spent most of the past 15 years of my life in a place where people actually know more about our governing system than their own because they have no, no say whatsoever in who governs them. So believe me, when, when I say we get a chance to engage via voting, I believe this to be a privilege. Now, the reality is that our faith may inform different believers in different ways, right? Right? The issues that we vote on, that we vote about, are always layers and layers deeper and more complex than the explanations are, that are offered to us, especially in this world, like I said, when they're offered eight seconds at a time. So in the end, people may choose to vote in different ways based on how they're reading the scriptures. I know Christians more mature and more wise than I am, and they fall on both sides of our American political spectrum. Their choices are informed by their faith. But all that to say what I don't want you to hear me saying this morning is that these issues are not important or not to engage or not to vote. That's not what I'm saying. So please don't hear me saying that. But this is my fear. At some point over the last several years, and we in the church have not been immune to this, at some point, political identities began to become primary. And I, I don't know when that happened, but I suspect it has something to do with our phones and social media and news outlets and these things that profit massively from pushing people to the extremes with false narratives of false villains and false messiahs on both sides of the spectrum. And at some point in all of this, engagement began to mean identifying with a party or a candidate much more than we would have 10 or even 15 years ago. Political expressions have become much stronger, right? My wife and I, since we've been back in America, we've noticed what used to be a sign in a yard in support of a preferred political candidate. Now, often we'll walk by and it involves giant banners covering the fronts of homes. It's more like political Christmas decorations now. As if one were to say that this is the first thing I want people to identify me by. And it's really easy, I think, for us as believers to get drawn into this. Sometimes our hatred for those who we are, who we are against has grown beyond what it should as Christians. Sometimes our love for those who we are for has grown beyond what it should as Christians. We have to be careful because in all of this, we, we, we can be under the threat of losing our primary identity. As we engage, as we do these things, and we, whether that's engaging online in, in discussion, whether that means going to vote, as we engage these things, we operate the right that's given to us by nature of living in a democracy in the midst of that as believers and as citizens of this kingdom, under this king, we have to keep our primary identity primary. That means that in the end, we are not primarily a member of any political party. That's not to say that that can't be an identity of ours. But it can't be the primary identity. Because in the end, primarily, we're absolute monarchists. 
we have an absolute monarch, a king without term limits, a king who surpasses, who is greater than the kings of this world, than the rulers of this world, the king who sets up and who takes down rulers. And that has to inform the underlying attitude of how we go about engaging these issues. When we engage, we have to keep our primary identity primary. That means that as we engage, as we think about these things, as we vote, we don't do this in such a way that our actions are the end-all, be-all of history. Are the issues that concern our nation right now important? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Do they determine significant things? Absolutely, without a doubt. But does any one governing actor or role or position have the ability to usurp the throne of our king? To take sovereign rule out of his hands? To force him to a plan B? There is no executive order, legislative law, or Supreme Court decision that has the ability to touch the reign of our king. Omnipotence is exactly that. Omnipotence. There can only be one omnipotent one. And the very nature of omnipotence says it's impossible for others to be all-powerful. There's only one all-powerful one. No one can usurp the power or the authority of our king. The Israelites of Isaiah's day needed a king. We today have that king. He is our king and our primary identity has to be as citizens who fall under his reign and the reign of that kingdom. Nothing shocks him, nothing alarms him, because nothing happens apart from his control. And I'm sure there are people here coming from both sides of the political spectrum. And everyone, I think, is tempted to feel alarmed and shocked and scared, no matter what the results are in the next week or two weeks or however long it takes for them to figure this thing out, come to a final decision. But the reality is in the next week or in two weeks or in two years or four years or six years, Jesus will still be the king. And he is your king. And that has to be our primary identity. So maybe the reset that we need today is an identity reset. Where you have a king that surpasses the kings of the world. And that means that you belong to a kingdom that surpasses the kingdoms of this world. Keep looking with me at verse 6. Isaiah says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, Isaiah here is describing this future kingdom under this messianic king that he describes in verses 1 to 5. And what kind of kingdom is this? Well, it's a kingdom of peace, right? In all of these descriptions of animals that are supposed to be eating each other, eating grass instead, lying down together, children playing with poisonous snakes. I know some of you in here are like, not now, not in the kingdom to come. That's not going to happen. But in all of this here, we see a kingdom where there is really what can only be described by its Hebrew word. And it's a Hebrew word that I think many of us know in here, shalom. Now, before I keep going further, I recognize when I'm at OGC, I'm in the midst of a number of you who are smarter than me, a number of you who are RTS students. Some of you are probably writing on this passage right now in more depth, and you're going to immediately say, but it doesn't talk about shalom in this passage. It's true, Isaiah doesn't use that word in the passage, but I really think that is exactly what he's describing here. And the problem with shalom is we tend to think of it as meaning peace, but Peace for us, we tend to think of as like no more wars or in the example of this passage, no more great National Geographic videos, right? But the reality is with, with shalom, it's more than just no more wars. Shalom has a deeper meaning. 
It means that things are as God intends them to be. In other words, things are as they are supposed to be. And here's the thing about shalom. Shalom is disrupted by sin. And shalom cannot be the ultimate state of things in this world as it is today. So on the one hand, we we have this king. We don't want to be drawn into fear and the feeling that everything is ending forever because we have hope. But on the other hand, we don't want to be drawn into a false hope that a utopia can be built in this world as it is. Because the reality is shalom, it cannot fully exist with sin. So what that means for us today is that our hope ultimately cannot be in a recovered economy or any world leader or political candidate. Because in the end, none of those things will ultimately bring us the shalom that we long for. Isaiah is saying to the people of God, people that are longing for shalom that is not the state of things in their world, right? He's telling them, this, this is where you're heading. This is the end game here. And we today are God's people and we today long for a shalom that's not the state of things in this world. And at times I think that longing can drive us to the fear and the anxiety and that longing can drive us to the things that we do and and losing our primary identity. I don't have to go into details about this. I don't think any of you are going to argue with me this morning. Things are not as they are supposed to be. But in the midst of this, as the people of God, we have hope because we know our destination. We know that at the end of all of this, God will fulfill his mission and the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea there will be a kingdom not only a spiritual kingdom in heaven but a real kingdom a physical kingdom as Christ resurrected physically in the body as he ascended in his resurrected body as he sits at the right hand of God in his resurrected flesh and as he will return one day in the flesh to make it all new and that kingdom will be a worldwide kingdom it's going to be universal and in that kingdom there will be no more mourning or crying or tears or political infighting, or divisions, or COVID-19, or pain, or death. So if things don't quite feel like home to us today, it's because we're not home. Things are not as they're supposed to be. And Isaiah gives us a picture of what's supposed to be. And I think for us today, there's pain in that especially when we compare where we are now with that hope. But with that pain, always, always comes hope. And where is that hope? Well, I think verse 9 gives us the key that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. I am a career missionary, so... I tend to see these things in scripture. You can roll your eyes at me if you want, but I think it it is interesting that embedded in a passage about a future kingdom under a king who is going to bring this kingdom about, a king who cannot be defeated, embedded in all of this, there's a statement of mission. That the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, right? This, This has been the mission ever since God told Adam and Eve to take the perfection of Eden and extend it to the world to fill and subdue, right? It's been the mission ever since he told Noah the same thing after the flood. Since God told Abraham that the nations would be blessed through him, it was the mission that God gave to Israel on Sinai. It was the mission that Isaiah, I think he's reminding the Israelites of his day to remember. And it's a mission that cannot fail 100%. It's one that we are to take part in. And I do think that Isaiah is nudging the people of God here to remember, to remember who they are and to remember the mission that God has given them. Through their apostasy, through their idolatry, they're not taking part in that mission. This mission that Isaiah's emphasis is that God is infallibly going to bring it about. They're missing it. And for us today, I think that's how the hope of the kingdom can drive us as God's people. 
We've been put on an unfailing mission by being made citizens of the kingdom through the blood of the king. So what that means is that we are kingdom ambassadors. And what that means is that that calls for a certain way of living in this time. We are to be beacons of hope. We're beacons of hope because on the one hand, we know that there will be no utopia on this side of Christ's return. But that on the other side of Christ's return, we know that's coming. And so the reality that we live in now, and this already but not yet, it's a reality of quiet confidence. We're to be as those who live as if the situation that we face today is real. Like I've said, we engage. These issues do matter. The scriptures speak to these issues that we think about, that we talk about, that we vote on. But also at the same time, we live as if the situation is not final because there's always hope of a coming day. So the times may change, but our hope does not. And in this world of scary headlines and distrust and everyone opining as an expert on social media, believe me, when you live with that kind of a quiet, settled hope in the reality of the world and the hope of what is to come, that sticks out. You'll be noticed. You'll shine like a light and opportunities to share about the king and his kingdom will arise from that. I think this also means that we need to pay attention to who's doing the work of discipleship in our lives. Who's discipling us? When we lived in East Asia, I had some friends who worked for the foreign service. Uh, they worked at the U.S. consulate in our city. And if I would have grabbed lunch with one of those friends and he would have told me, I get my main source of news comes from the East Asia state news, the East Asia state media, I would have laughed. I would have thought, how are you keeping your job? Because like everybody knows that's a false narrative, right? I mean, we know it being from outside of East Asia, people in East Asia know it. Everybody knows that is a false narrative. But we have to be careful because we have to be careful what we're filling our minds and our hearts with. Are we filling our minds and our hearts with the narratives that are played out over social media and on the news? Or are we filling our minds and our hearts with the narrative of scripture, right? The, the true narrative, the one true narrative that tells us what the problem is what the solution is, where we're headed. What is our role in that story? Because those narratives, they're not narratives of hope. Oftentimes they're narratives of fear and they thrive on fear. And oftentimes the fear may arise out of what seems to be a loss of utopia, utopia lost or utopia not yet gained. And because their fears and all of this is temporal, so their solutions are often found in temporal things, two to four to six to a lifetime appointment of years at a time. But we, we are ambassadors of the king. And that means we have a better narrative. That this world is not what it's supposed to be, that it won't be made that by any world leader, but that in the end, shalom will be ushered in by the king. And that is not a narrative of fear. That, that's a narrative of hope. And oftentimes you're not going to find that on your phone. You won't find that out there, right? You'll find it in here. I guess unless you have your Bible on your phone, then yes, you'll find it on your phone there. But you know what I mean? We have to be careful not to be discipled by false narratives, to fill our hearts and our minds with the true narrative so that we can live as ambassadors for the king. You see, Isaiah was speaking to a people who had been discipled by false narratives, a people who had put their trust in worldly powers, who had been enticed by these things, who were experiencing uncertainty and fear and who were tempted to forget who they were. And Isaiah is saying to them, here's the good news. God's promises haven't failed. No matter the king, a better one is coming. God will not fail at his promises, his promises that he made to Abraham, his promises that he made to David. A better king is coming. And no matter how bleak things look, this king will bring in the shalom that we're longing for. And so he's telling them, do your job as the people of God. Confess, repent, stay on mission. And because we live today on the other side of the resurrection, we read this looking backwards. So we too are able to do the work of confessing, repenting, 
seeing where I, our idolatries lie, seeing if we're getting carried away by that, seeing who's doing the work of discipleship in our lives and finding hope in the king and finding rest from the anxieties of the world from that king and being on mission for that king. For some of you here today, that may mean repentance. You may need to take a moment and see where your hope lies, where you've been building up messiahs, what you've been filling your heart and mind with. For some of you here today, that may mean that you just need to take a breath in all of the fear and the uncertainty that surrounds everything because in the end, the king is still on the throne. And we need to remember He's in control. Jesus is in control. And then for some of you who are here today or who've been watching, you might hear what I'm saying. You might think to yourself, I don't know this other narrative that you're talking about. I I want this peace. I want the peace of the kingdom you're describing. I, I want that kind of a hope. I want to be a citizen of that kingdom. And if that's you today, there are people here who would love to tell you how to do that. If you came with someone and you're here today with us, please talk to the person you came with. If you're watching online and you're not a member here, talk to the person who connected you. Because citizenship in the kingdom that we're talking about, it's not based on your wealth, your station in life, your race, or even your past. Citizenship in this kingdom is based solely on the king. And the king has said, all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. I will give them rest. You can become a Christian today. And this hope that Isaiah describes can be yours today. You have a king that surpasses the kings of this world. You have a kingdom that surpasses the kingdoms of this world. So we can have hope in these fearful and uncertain times. Pray with me. Father, there is no shortage of players all over on this stage of this world where we live who would seek to steal this hope, who would seek to steal our joy, who would seek to have us live as if these solutions that we will be voting on, that we've already voted on, that these are the ultimate end-all be-all. Lord, let us not be caught up in idolatry as we enter into this engagement, Lord, as we, as we engage in these issues that are surrounding us. Father, as we oftentimes do feel like we're just watching the merry-go-round spin around, trying to figure out where to grab on, Lord, would you give us wisdom from your word, Lord, from this community of believers to understand how we are to engage, to understand how we are to view these issues. But at the same time, Lord, would you not let us lose sight of our primary identity, that we are yours by virtue of your son who lived a life we couldn't live, who died a substitutionary death in our place, who rose again, who was interceding for us at the right hand of your throne who is coming again to reign would that be the narrative that drives all that we do in this season as we engage Lord would that be the narrative that soothes our fears and anxieties would that be the narrative that causes us to repent for the ways that we've been putting our hope our ultimate our primary hope and our primary identity and other things. And I ask this in the name of the King. Amen.